Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerSportsBetting.com, on Roku, Dwyer Boxing News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's talk about the integrity of baseball, right? Let's talk about the good old days, right? Now, let's roll back the clock to the shot heard round the world. Bobby Thompson's home run, right, that gave the then New York Giants the win over their crosstown rivals, the Brooklyn Dodgers. What we've come to learn from that early 1950s game, it's one of the biggest games in Major League history, right? We all grew up hearing about the shot heard round the world, right? Very few baseball players have had moments as big as that Bobby Thompson moment. But what we've come to learn is that the way the Giants got back into the pennant race that year was that they installed at the polo grounds, a sophisticated system of lights and other scenarios that actually allowed giant hitters to know what pitch was coming. Right? These days, as far as we know, there is no cheating in terms of sign stealing that's as brazen or as outrageous as that system that the Giants had that literally netted them the National League pennant, right? The cheating was institutionalized, right? Bobby Thompson, in later interviews, when confronted with this information, and by the way, it's now widely accepted. It's not speculation, folks. It's widely accepted that the Giants, in fact, had this system in place, right? Lights and all this other stuff, and that the team was complicit in it. In other words, this wasn't some fan-driven level of cheating. No, this was something that Leo DeRocher knew about, the manager of the Giants. This was something that the Giant hitters knowingly participated in. Right? Understand it's widely known now. Bobby Thompson himself refused to acknowledge or deny that this system was in place. Right? That moment. In fact, the Giants being in that playoff, coming back from way out that year was the result of institutionalized cheating. Let's roll it forward a little bit. Pirate pitcher Harvey Haddix is on the mound. This is the late 50s. He's throwing a perfect game. He throws the perfect game through nine innings. He's into extra innings, throwing a perfect game against the Braves. Now what you need to know, what's been established historically, is that the Braves were cheating in that game, right? The Braves literally had a system where some guy out in the bullpen was doing certain things to let Brave hitters know what Harvey Haddix, who was perfect through nine innings, was pitching, right? Think about it. Now the folklore is, and it's folklore, that Hank Aaron on the Braves refused to participate in the group cheating. Right now, look, I don't know if Hank or if Eddie Matthews, by the way, understand, there are multiple Braves in the Hall of Fame on that team. I don't know if those guys ever participated in the group cheating, but understand, there was group cheating. 
right? This is years before PEDs, right? This is literally a group of players doing more than just your run-of-the-mill stealing of signs, right? This is literally institutionalized stealing where guys are doing things like hanging a towel in the bullpen to tip off batters on their team what a pitcher is throwing. Let me tell you, I was raised in the 1970s, right? That's when I was a kid. That's why I got some gray hair <laughs> on my chin today. It's well earned, trust me, right? And you need to understand that I was in New York City. In 1973, the New York Mets shocked everyone and actually made the World Series. Right, That was the year of Tug McGraw, who would later be a Philly, talking about you got to believe and stuff like that. Now understand, amphetamine use was rampant in the big leagues. I mean rampant in the big leagues in the 1970s. If you don't believe me, just go back to Jim Bouton's Ball Four, written at the beginning of the decade. Right Now understand, there's at least one man who talks about getting a, an amphetamine lace drink from a Met teammate who, without me naming him directly, let's just say he's in the Hall of Fame today, right? In the 70s, understand, you had Doc Ellis of the Pirates pitch a no-hitter on LSD. How do we know? Because Doc Ellis himself admits he was on LSD. He didn't even know what was going on. He had his best stuff ever. And of course he wasn't stressed because he was on the mound tripping. Right? Understand you had a player who played in the 1970s. Amos Otis on the Kansas City Royals. Back then you only had two divisions in the American League. The Kansas City Royals multiple times. Multiple times won the American League West and faced the Yankees back then. And understand Amos Otis, when he retired, admitted that during that period of time, and he was a key player of that Royal team with people like George Brett, Fred Patek, others, John Mayberry, well, understand Amos Otis admitted that he used to cork bat that entire time period. Fast forward to the 1980s. Let me tell you, if you don't think that cocaine gives people a false sense of confidence, then you just don't know what's going on. Why else do you think people use cocaine? Right now, let's, all I can say is, you had guys like Steve Howe, the coke machine in the 1980s, but you need to understand that many other guys, MVP winners, multiple MVP winners admitted to using cocaine. Now, I'm not going to name names for legal reasons, but understand that some of these guys were on pennant winning teams, right? Multiple cocaine winners. Let me tell you too, one team, just look at the New York Mets, 1986. One team had a key member who actually missed the World Series Parade. Why? Because he was meeting his drug dealer. How do we know? That player has written a book. That book is in bookstores today. Well now let's fast forward to the present. In fact before we do, late 1980s. How obvious was the steroid use? Let's go back to the 1988 Kirk Gibson home run off Dennis Eckersley game. When Jose Canseco comes up for his last at bat, the Dodger crowd, this is in the 80s, starts a chant of steroids, right? I'm just here to tell you, I lived through the 1980s. That decade was out of control on a level we can't appreciate today, right? And I'm just here to tell you that in the 1980s, we knew guys were juicing. There was a New York Jet who wasn't even a first-round pick, 
right? He shows up at college combines, is dominant. The Jets draft him. This guy then goes on to be one of the best athletes I have ever seen in my life. And understand, no one knew who he was for his first two years of college football. And, of course, this guy couldn't control his emotions, right? So he'd make a play, and he would literally start jumping up and down on the field. I'm just here to tell you that it's revisionist history today to believe that people back then did not suspect that folks were juicing, right? Understand, we knew at the time that guys were doing something. Years later, Mark Grace one time had some team check his bat, the former Cub, the former Arizona Diamondback, and he joked at the time. He said, don't check my bat, check my urine. Right now, I don't believe Mark Grace was a juicer, but all I'm saying is the guys in the game knew teammates were juicing. Right? I mean, you know, it's laughable to think otherwise. Well, now let's talk about today. Today you have a whole new level of unnatural performance that's completely legal. Don't you think that if Hank Aaron had access to LASIK surgery back in the day, that he wouldn't have hit more home runs? Could you imagine Roberto Clemente, and understand, this is a guy who goes through the dead ball era with a career batting average of 317. Try that one, folks. Don't you think Roberto Clemente with LASIK surgery would have done far better than he did? You remember guys like Reggie Jackson wearing glasses during an at-bat? Could you imagine Reggie Jackson with LASIK surgery? Understand, without LASIK surgery, Reggie Jackson is Mr. October. With LASIK surgery, without the glasses, without the fog and dirt on the glasses, Reggie Jackson would be unstoppable. Well, these days you have LASIK surgery. Back in the day, if you had a knee injury, you were missing 40 games. Today, you got arthroscopic surgery. Right? Today, you have pitch counts. Understand, when Bob Gibson had an ERA of something like 1.12 in 1968. I'm not sure if Bob Gibson was ever taken out of a game from the mound. Right? I mean, never happened. Understand, back then, guys were pitching heavy innings. Denny McLean in 68 won over 30 games. Right? Last pitcher to do so. Guys don't have the opportunity these days to do stuff like that because the game has changed. Right? Now, everything's computerized. Right? So my point is simply this. The stats today, without PEDs, right, are completely unnatural as they are. Right? Babe Ruth didn't have access to LASIK surgery. Obviously, there was heavy cheating going on in Babe Ruth's day, just like there are cut corners today. So let me say this. Given that we've gone through periods in baseball of institutionalized sign stealing, like in the early 1950s, right? Um, given that baseball has always had drug use, how could anyone watch Louis Tion with a cheek full of tobacco and believe that he's not getting the equivalent of, you know, a pack of cigarettes nicotine hit while he's on the map, right? Given that baseball's always had drugs, right? Amphetamines, cocaine, now PEDs, right? Stanazole and all this other stuff. Aren't we being a little bit ridiculous to act like there was ever a cheat-free period of baseball? Folks, you have a guy in the Hall of Fame who's admitted to throwing spitballs. 
right? You have another guy in the Hall of Fame who once had an ump come out to the mound to check his glove for grease and other stuff because his ball was moving. And of course, the guy had a note in his glove that said, not here. Another time he was busted with sandpaper. He's in the Hall of Fame, right? This game was never pristine. Stealing signs, cutting corners has always been a part of the game, right? In the 60s, Murray Wills was a great base stealer. You want to know what teams started doing? They started watering down their base paths, right? Why? They couldn't handle Murray Wills on a regular field. So they, of course, made the field unnatural. That's the history of the game. Cork bats, etc. Right? And so now, for us to look at A-Rod, and for us to look at Ryan Braun, and for us to say, you've got to be kidding. This guy's a cheater. You know what? If cheating is the line of demarcation, you're going to have to start taking guys out of the Hall of Fame by the dozens. Let me say this, you know, I believe the critics of Ryan Braun are on the wrong side of history. I know this is going to get a lot of comments, but let's get real. You know, people who aren't athletes are out there looking to extend their lives and to improve their health with modern technology, whether it's engineered foods, whether it's HGH. One of the claims Roger Clemens made about HGH and, you know, um, why there was HGH evidence around it was that his wife was on HGH. She wasn't a major leaguer, right? She was using HGH for health reasons. So my point is simply this. We can pretend that only deviants use HGH. We know as a society that's not true. We can pretend that every baseball record is authentic. We know from history that's not true. Think about it. Just the Braves. Forget Hank Aaron for a second. What about Eddie Matthews? If Eddie Matthews took advantage of the cheating system that the Braves had in place where they were stealing signs and stuff like that, hanging towels in the bullpen, how many of his home runs came on pitches that he was tipped off on? How many wins that the Giants got in 1951 came on pitches that their hitters were tipped off on? Keep in mind, Willie Mays was a Giant, right? Just food for thought, right? How do we know that any of these numbers are completely accurate? Also, Mickey Mantle admits to drinking too much when he played. You know what? Some people handle stress better when they're lit. How do we know that Mickey Mantle's performance would have been the same if he wasn't lit? We don't. So, what I think baseball should do, quite frankly, is they should have a testing program for guys who want a special designation. In other words, if I want the glory that comes with having been drug-free and all-natural, then I should sign on voluntarily to some program and understand what that means. That would mean that in addition to not taking what's deemed performance-enhancing drugs, and let's, let's get real here, the designations are completely arbitrary. Right? It's like if I smoke weed, a natural substance, I'm breaking some drug rule. But if I chew tobacco, a natural substance, I'm clean and I'm in line with baseball history. Right? The distinctions are arbitrary. But if I'm going to try to prove that I'm a natural player, then I've got to sign off on something that says, go ahead and randomly drug test me. Also, any new surgery, LASIK surgery, that would give me an advantage that Stan Musial didn't have, that Hank Aaron didn't have, that Babe Ruth didn't have, right? I'll agree not to undergo it. 
because otherwise I'd be benefiting off of technology just like guys using modern performance enhancing drugs right you can't have a bogus distinction where guys are able to go in have surgery fix torn biceps so that the biceps even bigger than it was when they went in a surgery right you know have cartilage and all this other stuff injected into the knee right so that my knees as good as new don't you think Willie Mays would have loved to have had that opportunity in the early 70s I mean my point is simply this aren't athletes benefiting today in ways that the benchmarks of the sport back in the day didn't benefit excluding PEDs so isn't the whole argument that guys today you know are doing something that guys in the past didn't do bogus hasn't it always been that way let me hear from you I believe in 20 years we're gonna look back when numerous guys who we have suspicions about using PEDs end up in the Hall of Fame because there's no failed test there's just the suspicion right when those guys start to get in the Hall of Fame the dam's gonna break let me also point out too and I think we all know this intuitively it's not a real Hall of Fame if you aren't going to allow a Roger Clemens or a Barry Bonds into the Hall of Fame right because those guys were the dominant players at their position during their time or at least on the very short list right is it really a Hall of Fame if I don't have Mark McGuire and Rafael Palmero and Sammy Sosa in the Hall of Fame and my point is once you start to admit those guys once you start engaging in the thought process of you know what Clemens was a Hall of Famer before he started juicing as if any of us know the exact date when Clemens started juicing or you know what Barry Bonds when he was skinny Barry Bonds was a Hall of Famer before he started juicing as if any of us know the exact date when Barry Bonds started juicing right once you start rationalizing letting juicers into the hall I believe you have to let them all in all of the ones with Hall of Fame career performances so let me hear from you unless baseball is gonna just arbitrarily come up with some testing regimen where they can say you know what this guy went through this testing regimen for this year and so his record gets a special star you know this guy didn't go through the testing regimen whether he's using or not and so while we'll recognize him as the record holder he's the record holder without the special designation unless baseball goes to some two-tier system of keeping stats we need to give guys like Ryan Braun a break right let's also talk about his MVP for a second are we gonna strip Ryan Braun of his MVP but not strip Ken Caminetti how can we look at multiple MVPs pleading guilty to involvement with cocaine allow them to keep their trophies but yet strip Ryan Braun right also with all due respect to Matt Camp how do any of us know with certainty what was going on with Matt Camp's nutrition right because now the big thing with athletes is to say as Tyson Gay the sprinter has said I trusted the wrong people right isn't that now the mea culpa right so at this point I don't think you can take away any MVPs let me also say this too just logically and I understand the Ryan Braun case has a lot of smoke right but how can we exclude the possibility that a guy was clean when he won an MVP and then decided to get dirty later because isn't that exactly the argument many people are making and arguing that Clemens and Bonds were Hall of Famers winning awards legitimately before they started cutting corners right if they cut corners allegedly let me hear from you
Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. I'm not saying that juiced up athletes don't have an advantage. Rather, what I'm saying is that the sport of baseball has always had cut corners. Always. Right? And that now we have a bit of a double standard. If baseball really wants to have a set of records that they're convinced are absolutely clean, they're going to have to go to a two or three tier record keeping system. They're going to have to have some group of athletes opt into random frequent drug testing and some pledge to report any sign stealing from their team and all this other stuff. And of course, not to undergo, you know, experimental uh, you know, health treatments and steroid therapy, right? Because now we even have doctors prescribing steroids, right? And some carve out of legitimate use of steroids that, quite frankly, wasn't available back in the day of Mays, Aaron, Ruth, DiMaggio, Mantle, etc. Let me hear from you. Thanks for stopping by.